good to have you all. And for those, uh, you know, I, it's been a while. I haven't thanked everyone who tunes in on Facebook. So thank you for being with us as well. It's good to have you all here. Have a number of announcements for you. And by the way, thanks for being here on time. <laughs> yeah, everybody's still adjusted, or do we see a lot of sleepy faces around? Yeah. So, but it's good to have you all here. We have a, a, if you are not a member and wish to become a member of our church, we can get some classes going now. You can see our brother Richard Torres back there, or you can see Pastor or myself, and we'll get you going on a class. Or if you wish to be baptized, if you wish, if you have not been baptized, we also can have a class for that to explain what baptism is and what it isn't so that you know from a biblical perspective what baptism is. We also have, I just drew a blank, uh, our brother Jesus, Jesus Valenzuela, he is uh, getting, collecting blankets, towels, clothing for the homeless. So if you have clothes that you just have hanging there that you haven't worn, it's good clothing, but you haven't worn in the last 15 years, you can put it in a bag, bring it, and Brother Jesus will take care of the rest, and we have till the end of the month. Is that correct, Brother? Yes. Okay, and that's Brother Jesus right there. Ooh. That's Brother Jesus, for those of you who don't know him. Most of you do know him. And uh, thank you for doing that for those that need, Brother. And last but not least, there's a gift for you guys here. Thanks to our brother John Nadius, who brought some lemons. They're out on the, on the bench out there. So if you wish to get free lemons, go ahead. There's bags out there. Correct, brother? There's bags out there and the lemons are out there. Go ahead and nab some. That's the extent of our announcements. Thanks for being with us and God bless you. Thank you, Raul. All right. Maybe we should pray for ba uh, Baltazar. That's uh, Rinalda and Balt's son. He is in the Hopi Reservation today preaching. And he will be for five days. Five days short-term missionary trip out in the Hopi Indian Reservation. So Brother Balt is preaching out there. Do we have any first time visitors? Okay, we have a guest right here. Your name and where are you from? Uh, my name is Celia, I'm from Boyle Heights. Amen, Celia? Yes. Celia, thank you for being with us. All right, there's a little visitor's card for you. Okay. You guys all make sure you greet Celia after the service. And uh, that was a beautiful service that you had for your father, you. my brother Leonard. He lived to be 102 years old. He would have been 103 this week, wow. this week. And I was amazed at how many family members were there. How many grandkids? Did you get those numbers? 64 grandkids. How about great grandkids? I mean, grandkids, great and great great grandkids. Okay, so he had five kids. Leonard's the youngest. Six. Six kids. So out of those six, uh, multiplied. So that whole church was all, all the family. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to pray for Balt. Baltazar and ask God to be merciful to him as you know the uh, Indian reservations are dark spiritual places yeah. if you don't believe me you talk to Ronaldo she's a Hopi Indian she was uh, she married a Mexican and but she knows about the whole Indian culture so we're going to pray for her son for their son today as he preaches the gospel in a very dark land father we do lift up our brother Balt and his team as they minister to the Hopi Indian Reservation. We pray that there would be a breakthrough of light in the darkened 
lands of, of the reservation. We pray that you would use him and your message to bring light to the, the Hopi people. And we thank you, Lord. We pray now that you would enlighten us as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we are going to start a new book this morning. So we're going to start Daylight Savings Time with a brand new book. First John. As you know, John wrote five, five pivotal books of the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel of John. First, second, and third John, these short letters, and the book of Revelation. So John, the apostle, is a very important biblical writer. Now personally, I have always found John's writings to be difficult. And I'm not embarrassed to say that because a couple weeks back in 2 Peter... I'll just read this. Peter says that Paul was difficult to understand. So I'm in good company. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, Peter writes about Paul and says, As also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. So Peter said... I have a hard time understanding Paul. So I can say I have a hard time understanding John. I mean, we, we, we're going to understand him. But it's, uh, it, out of all the apostles, uh, I struggle a little bit with John. You may not because you're smarter. But uh, so we're, we're going to look at 1 John. Now, analyzing the first chapter, 10 verses, it's all about apostolic authority. John was an apostle, as you know. And his authority was being questioned and challenged by the false prophets. So in verse 1, he lays out his credibility. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Basically, he's saying, we were eyewitnesses. We saw Jesus with our eyes. We heard his words with our ears. We touched him with our hands. We were eyewitnesses of Jesus. We are apostles. And John is having to defend his apostolic authority. Because there's a lot of false prophets. For instance, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. He calls, he calls his, uh, his audience children. It's the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now... Many antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. Now these antichrists, we know about the antichrist, but he's saying a lot of lesser antichrists have appeared. So he is battling antichrists, plural. Where did they come from? Verse 19. They went out from us. They were part of the church. They attended. They were with us. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. 
For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out, so it would be shown that they are not all of us. All these little antichrists came out from the church and began to challenge the apostles. Look at 1 John chapter 4. Another indication of what he's dealing with. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many false prophets. So he's dealing with antichrists, plural. He's dealing with false prophets. And in 2 John, his next epistle, there's only one chapter, verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. So there are antichrists, there are false prophets, and there are deceivers. So John is embattled. He's getting challenged by the Antichrist. He's getting challenged by the false prophets. They're all coming at him. He's getting challenged by the deceivers. Satan has arisen his, his horde of, of adversaries coming after John and the other apostles. They all had their enemies. For instance, Paul had false prophets coming after him. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul had his adversaries. Verse 12. Excuse me, 2 Corinthians 11. Can't read my own writing here. 11 verse 12. But what I am doing, I will continue to do. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 11, 12. So that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are, prophets, in the matter about which they are boasting. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. So John had his detractors, enemies, so did Paul. All the apostles did. They all did. So Paul begins his epistle here in 1 John by asserting his authority, his credibility. And we read that. He said, these other false prophets, they don't have any credibility. They weren't with Jesus. We were. We've, we've, let me reread re the first verse. What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands. We were there. We are apostles. And that's the mark of an apostle. There's a lot of people today that claim to be apostles, but they're not. Because they don't have the three criteria of a true apostle. Number one, you had to be an eyewitness. Nobody today can, sit, can claim to be an eyewitness. They weren't there 2,000 years ago. You had to be an eyewitness. You had, been, you had to have been chosen. Jesus went up on the hill and he prayed and he chose his 12 apostles. And thirdly, true apostles had the ability to perform signs and wonders and miracles. 
which nobody can do today. They pretend to do it, but they really can't. Can anybody raise the dead? No, the apostles could. Signs and wonders and miracles. The signs, well, let, let's read that verse, 2 Corinthians 12. This way you won't get confused when somebody says they're an apostle. You can say, no, you're not. You're a false apostle. Can you do this? 2 Corinthians 12, 12. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. That's a sign of a true apostle. So John begins this letter by asserting his credibility, his apostleship. So that's apostolic authority. Now, the, ap the apostles were defenders of orthodoxy. They were defenders of the faith. Now the false prophets in 1 John, their main attack theologically, they were attacking the humanity of Christ. Now you and I know that Jesus Christ was God. Amen? Yeah. But he was man. He was man. He got hungry. He got tired. He got thirsty. He got lonely. He was a man. But he was God. A hundred percent God and a hundred percent man. The false prophets of John's day were saying he wasn't truly human. Basically, their thought was, how can an all-powerful, eternal, holy God become a man? That's impossible. How can that be? How could he become a man? So John is writing to defend the orthodox position of the true humanity and physicality of Jesus Christ. Basically in verse 1 he said, we touched him. He was a man. That's what he says in verse 1. We touched him with our hands. We touched him. Chapter 4 of 1 John, verse 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Amen. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. But this is the spirit of the Antichrist. So, the main issue was the humanity of Christ. And John said, we touched him. Second John, the, the uh, controversy continues. Second John, verse 7. We read that, we read part of that verse. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ, as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. So, John was battling these false prophets that were teaching that Jesus Christ is not human. He's not a man. He's not flesh. And John said, yes, he is. We touched him. We saw him with our eyes. We heard him with our ears. He's physical. We touched him. Now, after Jesus rose from the dead, his disciples thought he was a spirit. Remember that in Luke? Luke 24, they thought he was a spirit, a ghost of some kind. And in Luke 24, he proves to them that he was 
physical. Luke 24, 36. While they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. This is after he rose from the dead. But they were startled and frightened, thought they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? Was he hungry? I doubt it. He just wanted to show that he was physical. They gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it before them. I am physical. I'm human. I'm glorified. I rose from the dead. But I'm not simply a spirit. <clears throat> so Jesus, uh, John, excuse me, in 1 John is, is combating this. Now go back to, to verse 1, the latter part of verse 1. The last part of verse 1. We touched him with our hands concerning the word of life. That's a name for Jesus, the word of life. And the life was manifested. Manifested. What does that mean? To be revealed, to be disclosed, to be made known, to be manifested. The life, the word of life, Jesus Christ, was manifested, was revealed, made known. And we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life. God became a man and he manifested, the word right there, he manifested. He revealed himself through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ reveals God. Now let's look at John's gospel, John chapter 1. Remember John wrote... The Gospel of John, John chapter 1, so there's a lot of parallels, parallel concepts and language. Jesus is called in 1 John the Word of Life. The Word of Life. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, there's that phrase, the Word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, a reference to the Word, was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So who is the Word? Well, verse 14, and the Word became flesh. Who did that? Jesus Christ. He's the eternal Word of God. He became flesh and dwelt among us, and we, we beheld His glory. So the Word, back in, in 1 John... God became a man to manifest himself. So we see apostolic authority, apostolic defense, apostolic proclamation. Verse 2, 1 John. And the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim. We do two things. We testify, testify. Ever testify in a court hearing? Most of us haven't. But it's a legal thing. You testify. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. You testify in a court of law. Truthful. 
What you have seen, what you have witnessed, what you are a, a, a witness of. So testify is kind of a legal term. What we have seen, we testify and proclaim. Two things. We proclaim. Proclamation. What is that? Bold, courageous, confident, forth telling. Proclaim. So we testify and we proclaim. That's what the apostles did. And they passed the baton on to us. And that's what we do. We testify and we proclaim. Amen. What do we proclaim? The eternal life. Now we're used to talking about eternal life as a quality of life. But here, eternal life is speaking about Jesus Christ. Not only is he the word of life, verse 1, but he is eternal life. It's kind of another name for Jesus. He is called the eternal life. The eternal life. Christ is the life and he gives the life. See that concept? He is the eternal life. He gives the life because he is the life. Now, in John 17, 3, about eternal life, it defines, what is eternal life? What is eternal life? It's more than just living forever. And do you want eternal life? Yes, you do. This is what you got to do to get it. It's more than just living forever. John 17, 3. And this, it, this is eternal life. Here's the definition. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So eternal life is a relationship with the eternal Son, who calls himself eternal life in 1 John. So the apostles proclaim the eternal life. That's another way of saying they proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal source of life, because he is the life. Now this is important for us, because we live in a death culture. Yeah. It's all about death. That's why, well, I don't want a lot of you guys are, everybody wears black now. <laughs> I, I have I have black clothing, so don't I'm not calling you out. Shouldn't have started this. Sorry, Rudy. Everybody black is the most popular color, if you will. Although technically black and white are not colors. That's another that's another subject. White is the absence of all color. Black is the white is the presence of all color and black is the absence of all color so technically they're not colors but don't worry about that Andrews is throwing me off we live in a death cult a death culture and the Israelis are finding out it's really hard to to uh, destroy People that don't care if they die. Bomb us. Kill us. We don't care. We'll just be martyrs. We don't care if we die. It's hard to gain victory over a, a, a mindset like that. So we, we, do, we, live in a, we live in a death culture, but Jesus is all about life. Life. We are people of life. We embrace life. We protect life. And that's the life of the unborn. We are people that value life. We love life. And we want to we have eternal life because we serve the one who calls himself 
eternal life. The apostles testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father. So we know he's talking about Christ and was manifested to us. And then they proclaimed salvation in a unique way. Verse 3. We, we rarely see salvation, the invitation, put this way. Verse 3. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also. So that you too may have fellowship with us. We want you to be part of our apostolic band of brothers. We want you to be part of our, our, uh, our, the fellowship of truth. We want you to have fellowship with us. We want you to be with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father. And with his son, Jesus Christ. So the father gave this message to the son. And the son gave the message to the apostles. And the apostles give the message to you and I. We want you to be part of the apostolic fellowship. We want you to be part of the church. Part of the apostolic band of brothers. The fellowship of the one true God. Have fellowship with us because our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus. So it's kind of a unique way of talking about salvation. You don't get it right away, but then, uh, you know, once you kind of wrestle with it, you see what they're doing. Now, apostolic teaching. It gets a little practical here. Verse, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you. First of all, the source of their message. Where did the apostles get the message that caused them to write the New Testament? This is the message we have heard from him. We got it from God. We were inspired by God. No prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. It's not, it's not our... It, it, these, uh, these thoughts, these concepts, these ideas, these truths didn't emanate from our human mind. We were conduits of truth. We heard it from Him... And we announce it to you. So the source of God's word and message is God himself. And here, here's the message. This is the message. God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. Paul, John loves the metaphor of light and darkness. You see it all throughout his writings. Light and darkness. God is light. What does that mean? He's absolutely holy. He's majestic. He's light. He's not, there's no darkness in him at all. No evil. It speaks about the absolute holiness of God. And then in contrast, in contrast, the utter sinfulness of man. Man is so sinful. He has the ability to deny reality. Look at verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him, I'm a believer, I believe in God. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth. A lot of people say, well, I'm religious. I'm a Catholic. I don't want to name any political people that like to fly that flag. But then you look at stuff that they promote and, and uh, champion. It's totally against, totally against God and his word. I'm a religious person. No, you're not. You're... You walk in darkness. 
You walk in darkness, and what does God say you are? You're a liar. You're a big fat liar. You're not, you don't belong to Him. You say you have fellowship with Him. You might even believe it. You might even totally, uh, totally believe it. But if you walk in darkness, you lie. You lie. You're a liar. People have the ability to believe their own lies. That is evidence of man's utter sinfulness. He can believe his own lies. Not only that, look at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, who says that? Everybody I know, they know they're a sinner. There are some people though, they're so steeped into sin... They have the ability in their own minds to claim sinless perfection. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. You see, sin is so utterly sinful that people believe their own lies and actually believe that they are without sin. Sin. That's what verse 10 says. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, part of becoming a Christian is you have to admit you are a sinner. Step number one, I'm a sinner. I have disobeyed God's law. I am guilty and I will pay the penalty for my sin. But Lord, please forgive me. I confess my sins. I repent of my sins. I know I'll never be free of them this side of heaven, but I'm battling, I'm fighting. So the apostolic teaching is the absolute holiness of God and the utter depravity and sinfulness of man. And here's the good news. And the close on the good news. The amazing love and mercy of God. The amazing love and mercy of God. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. God has the ability... To take the red blood of Jesus and apply it to the black sin of our life and create whiteness and purity. It's a miracle. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. We have to acknowledge our sinfulness. We have to accept the payment that God made. Why did Jesus shed his blood why did he die? He died to pay the penalty of a righteous God. To enable you to be forgiven and have eternal life. Now, this is interesting here. Theologians. I'm just going to throw this out there. The blood of Jesus forgives us. Excuse me. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin then why do we need to do verse 9? Verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins, why do we have to confess our sins. That's your homework. <laughs> you figure that one out. But it's not too hard. John 13.10 kind of combines those two thoughts. John 13.10 You guys have access to commentaries, to the internet. I want you to I want you to play with that. C 
seemingly dilemma there. But it's really not. 13.10, it says, Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. You're completely clean. You've been bathed. You've been justified by the blood of Christ. But as you walk in this world, your feet get dirty. Your body is clean, but your feet pick up dirt along the way, and it's that which you have to confess. So, 1 John 1 9, remember this, is the Christian's bar of soap. Although that doesn't make any sense, we don't use bars of soap anymore, right? <laughs> We use pump, pump bottles. But in the old days, we had bar, we used bars of soap. If you were poor, you'd buy lava, because that was the cheapest kind. And, uh, well, most of us were raised with a bar of soap. 1 John 1 9 is the Christian's bar of soap. Because your feet get dirty, and you've got to confess your sins. If we confess our sins, do it every day. Amen. Do it as you sin, otherwise you might forget. When you want to get road rage and you're getting angry, say, Lord, forgive me. The dog is coming out again. <laughs> you got to keep the dog on a leash in the doghouse because it wants to come out. Yeah. It's a beast. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Are you a sinner? Yes, you are. You don't believe that? Ask your wife. You're a sinner. <coughs> and so is she. That's why it's amazing people stay married. Because you're married to another sinner. That's why people get married, it's therapeutic because you face with your own sinfulness, you've got to deal with it now. If you're single, you don't have to deal with it that much because you're not living in close proximity to another human being sinner. So it's, it's developmental to be married. You mature. It's painful because you realize how selfish you are, how short-tempered you are, how judgmental you are. And if you handle those things right, you will grow in grace. So confess your sins. That is the message of the apostles. The apostles proclaim the absolute holiness of God, the utter sinfulness of man, and the mercy and love of God in taking care of that sin problem. So, that's chapter 1. Apostolic credibility. We were eyewitnesses. We saw, we heard, we touched. Apostolic defense, defending the onslaughts of those that say Jesus Christ was not a man. And um, the other two points you have in your outlines. <coughs> so we're going to continue on 1 John next week and then 2 John and 3 John. And then Jude. We're going to continue going through all the general epistles. We did James. We did Peter. We're doing John. We'll do Jude. And then we'll figure out where we're going to go. So just stay put. Stay in tune. Let's bow in a word of prayer. As we invite our ushers forward to collect this morning's tithes and offerings, let us thank God. For you that are so faithful and consistent, basically you're investing in, etern in eternity. <clears throat> you can't take anything with you, but you can send some on ahead. Remember that. You can't take anything with you from this world, but while you live here, you can send some on ahead of you. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless this morning's offering. We ask that you would 
Bless the giver and the gift that it would be multiplied for your purposes. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.